Thank you, Serge, for your intro. So I'll more or less get straight into it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and we do have quite a few ladies here as well. Uh, this lecture was given this title because in Greek mythology it was Prometheus who gave us the secret of fire. And it's up to us to try to use this gift wisely instead of using it to destroy this beautiful planet. My purpose here tonight is not to provide a panacea for return to total natural sustainability, but to address the dual problems of environmental pollution and our future energy needs. Although I prepared these talks for the technical enthusiast, who is expected to have a basic understanding of the physical sciences, the ideas presented here tonight may still be within the understanding of those in the audience who may not have the necessary technical background. Unfortunately, my short-term memory is in decline with age. So I prepared these talks using scripted notes, although I will explain some of the slides in more detail. What we need is a clean and renewable fuel, one that will quench our thirst for energy without poisoning our habitat. At present, only hydrogen fuel can solve this problem. This is a huge subject for which I am trying to give an overall coverage in a very limited time span. The comprehensive lecture notes available at the store are provided specifically to help you fill in any details at your own pace. So I would ask you to bear this in mind as we delve into the mysteries of hydrogen and water as a fuel. To Thales of ancient Greece, 600 years before Christ, Water was the primordial element of everything material. But it wasn't until the 1800s that Henry Cavendish and Antony Lavoisier showed that water consisted of just two gases, one being oxygen and the other being hydrogen. Lavoisier was also the first to break down water using a huge magnifying glass to concentrate the rays of the sun. The Reverend W. Cecil, in a lecture to Cambridge Philosophical Society, proposed one of the first accounts of a hydrogen engine in 1820. He wrote, if two and a half measures by bulk of atmospheric air be mixed with one measure of hydrogen and a flame be applied, the mixed gases will expand into a space rather greater than three times their original bulk. Since the 1820s, there have been literally thousands of individuals and companies who have explored and developed hydrogen as a motive form of power. Had it not been for the development of petrol as a fuel, then hydrogen would have been the natural successor to the steam age. It is now possible to capture uh, carbon from biomass, coal, natural gas and oil using the caverna process. In this process at 1600 degrees Celsius, hydrogen can be removed leaving pure carbon behind for use as a replacement for plastics, steel and timber. The process can drive itself free of emissions. A single plant can produce 50 million cubic metres of hydrogen and 20,000 metric tonnes of carbon black per year. Responsible governments, like Canada, have such plants already in full production. Solar concentrators may also be used to split water directly at over 1,000 degrees centigrade or drive huge sterling motors to generate electricity and supply hydrogen without pollution or fossil fuels. With this country's abundant resources of natural gas and sunshine, why on earth should we need to turn to nuclear power? Now I'll put up my first slide there. Let's hope we haven't messed up the alignment. What I was talking about just now, here's Lavoisier uh, with his early experiments. Uh, he was a, a person responsible for naming both hydrogen and oxygen uh, back at the end of uh, the 1700s. Uh, down here, this is the very first solar generator of hydrogen. Uh, that's also Lavoisier down here standing there. This magnifying glass concentrates on this area here to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen from water. Uh, this which I spoke about here is the Hindenburg disaster, 1937. Up here is the, this is a modern solar separator and was designed by Roy McAllister, who is currently the president of the US Hydrogen Association. He's also a fantastic inventor. 
We'll talk about some of his inventions later on this evening. Uh, it can break down water directly uh, through catalyst action, or as I said before, use a Stirling motor. You can see here, this is a Stirling motor in this particular design. Uh, this goes by wires down to an electrolysis device where it breaks it up into hydrogen so it can be transported uh, by vehicle to where it's needed. First of all, tonight we're going to look at the Carnot cycle. In order to gain some understanding of how the power to drive a vehicle is developed within the internal combustion engine. Without this knowledge, it would be very hard to comprehend just what is needed to make it work efficiently. What Carnot demonstrated is it doesn't matter what material the engine is made out of, as long as it is strong enough to do the job. And it doesn't matter what fuel is used, so long as the heat output is capable of driving down the pistons under normal load. What is important, however, is that the power output of any internal combustion engine is determined only by the difference between the thermal energy of combustion and the thermal energy wasted to the environment. Thus, this indicates that oxyhydrogen fuel will work in any internal combustion engine, providing the engine is fitted with the necessary accessories and is suitably tuned. Uh, this is a, uh, a Carnot thermodynamic uh, diagram of an internal combustion engine. Uh, this area up here represents the temperature of combustion. This area below here represents the temperature that is wasted to the environment. Uh, this little area below here, marked Q1, is the energy of combustion, and below here, obviously, is the energy uh, that is wasted to the environment. Such as you see in this little calculation here, if you subtract the wasted energy uh, from the energy of combustion, you get the amount of work uh, that is available to actually drive your vehicle. As you can see by the diagram, by the proportions, only a very little amount is available to drive your engine. In fact, you would be lucky out of a petrol engine if you got about 20%. 20% if 20% of the money you spend is used to drive your vehicle and 80% comes out as waste heat, how many vehicles do you think you could drive on the petrol that you pay for? Anybody got any idea? Nobody? Five. Five vehicles you can drive on the energy that you pay for in your, your car, but you only get to drive one. Over here you see that situation. All of the energy is not going to waste. All of this energy here is going out as work to drive your engine. This is not contrary to thermodynamics, believe it or not. It doesn't contravene the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. The energy is conserved, as you can see. It comes from here, goes out into work. It doesn't contravene the second law of thermodynamics, which is the law of equilibrium states. Uh, heat always moves from a higher point to a lower point, and that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, third law doesn't really matter, that's about zero degrees Kelvin. And certainly you won't get all of this heat converted to work. Using the same layout as previously, these three diagrams show how different fuels affect the efficiency of an internal combustion engine. The combustion temperatures are based on known parameters, but the temperatures of the waste heat must be simulated because we cannot accurately uh, tell an exact temperature uh, for how much heat is wasted to the cylinder walls, how much heat is wasted to the cooling system, how much heat is wasted to the components within the combustion chamber, and the total amount of heat, including that which is goes through the exhaust and out into the atmosphere. Uh, so we've assimilated that. There is a way of getting that, and actually what you do it is in reverse. You see how much power goes to the wheels. You subtract this from the total energy level. That way you can get the waste heat. Is one way of doing it. This little figure down here uh, represents the thermal efficiency of the particular fuel. Other than that, everything's the same as in the previous diagram. So going first to the drawing on the left, this schematic represents the heat distribution in a petrol-powered engine. The heat of petrol combustion is around 1,800 degrees Kelvin, whereas the heat consumed by conduction and lost through the exhaust is represented by the temperature estimate of around 1,400 degrees Kelvin. Actually, it's a little bit higher. The thermal efficiency of petrol by this diagram is shown as 22% down here. 
However, as I said before, in a real engine, the petrol efficiency would be only about 20% or less of the total exposed potential. And as I said before, this means about 80% is lost out to the exhaust system and to the other components. Going now to the middle drawing here, this one here. Uh, this is an assimilation of an engine powered by diatomic hydrogen supplied from an onboard storage system. In other words, that's bottled hydrogen. With this fuel, about 2,400 degrees Kelvin will be generated by the combustion of diatomic hydrogen with air, whilst the equivalent temperature of the lost heat would be around 1,100 degrees Kelvin. The reason for the lower waste temperature is due to the fact that hydrogen has a much higher burn rate than petrol. Therefore, less heat would be lost due to conduction. In a fully aspirated engine, which means an engine with the maximum fuel content, these parameters would give a thermal efficiency of around 54%. So much, le much less heat would be wasted out here. More of it would go into operating the engine. However, in a normally aspirated engine, which means normal fuel usage when we talk about normally aspirated engines, far less hydrogen would be admitted to the combustion chamber, thus resulting in a thermal efficiency in a real engine of about the same as petrol, from about 15 to about 20%. Uh, the reason we don't get that 54% is because we can't get enough hydrogen into this engine to produce the necessary force on the pistons. The final diagram, the final drawing on the right, represents the fuel provided by an onboard hydrolyzer. The composition of hydrogen and oxygen entering the engine will depend on the type of device used. So different sorts of onboard hydrolyzers produce different combinations of hydrogen and oxygen, and we'll talk about that shortly. These gases can be either diatomic or a combination of hydrogen and oxygen called hydrogen hydroxide which is uh, HOH by chemical combination, or hydroxy for short, we call these immature gases. And we'll also discuss how that occurs uh, in these uh, systems a bit later. This drawing, however, represents a modest combustion temperature of around 3,000 degrees Kelvin for hydroxy fuel mixed with air. In a welding torch, hydroxy flame can be as high as 6,000 degrees Celsius. So the estimated combustion temperature is well within expectations at 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Accordingly, the waste heat of HOH is extremely low. Uh, we have some sort of proof of that later on in the evening. Whether hydrogen is used as a supplement or used as a primary fuel to power the engine, hydrogen or HOH is superior in every way to hydrocarbon fuels, with the exception of energy density. With modern materials and technologies, even this is no longer a problem which we will discover over the evening. All right, now we're going to have a look what happens with petrol in an internal combustion engine. A lot of you would already be aware about this, but uh, we're putting a new slant on it. So the ratio of air to gasoline used to power an internal combustion engine is usually defined in automotive terms as the ratio by weight, that is the mass, of air to gasoline of between 8 to 1 uh, for a rich mixture, 20 to 1 for a lean mixture, with the ideal being 15 to 1. Uh, with modern petrols these days, it's more like 17 to 1, but for the purpose of this exercise, uh, we'll deal with standard, that's 15 to 1. This means that a mass of 1 gram of gasoline requires 15 grams of air to produce ideal combustion, uh, the mix in an IC internal combustion engine. Uh, to relate this in terms of volume, 15 grams of air equals 12 litres of air, and 1 gram of gasoline equals 1.39 cubic centimetres of gasoline. As a ratio, therefore, the amount of petrol you actually put in your engine is approximately 8,633 to 1 in this particular device. Thus in a 1000 cc engine, 999.88 cubic centimetres is filled with air. 
whilst only 0.12 cubic centimetres would be filled with gasoline. And that again is a fully aspirated engine. That's if we fill the entire cylinder up with all the explosive mixture. Okay, let's move along from that one. So you've got an idea how the petrol goes into an internal combustion engine and some of you may not have realised before, some of you know about this 15 to 1 ratio but you've never realised on a volume basis just how little fuel, fuel goes into the internal combustion engine. Now we'll come to the question a lot of people might have asked. Okay, how much hydrogen? That's what you want to know. So with hydrogen H2, the flammability range when combined with air by volume is from 4% to 75% with the ideal being 29.3% by volume. Thus in a 1000 cc engine the volume of H2 required for combustion is from 40 cubic centimetres 750 cubic centimetres with the ideal deal being 293 cubic centimetres. That's the stachyometric mix of H2O water. <coughs> stachyometric simply means the ideal ratio of hydrogen and oxygen and that's again a fully aspirated engine. Uh, now if we evaluate the mass on a volume basis just for point of interest uh, 290 cubic centimetres of H2 would weigh about 24 milligrams and 710 cc's of air being the balance of that particular engine would weigh about 900 milligrams. So on a weight basis air to H2 is about 38 to 1. If now we were going to use a 2000 cc engine, that's a four cycle engine, and we're to operate that at 3600 rpm then it is quite obvious that 3600 litres of the mix, that's total mix, would be drawn into the engine every minute. So we'd have 60 litres per second approximately and at ideal ratio, providing we use this same combination that we have up here, uh, we see that's about 17.4 litres of H2 per second and as I said before that's a fully aspirated engine. So keep that in mind, if you fill the cylinder up that's how much hydrogen you would need in one second. We can evaluate, evaluate that by thermodynamic principles uh, where we don't have to use the volume of the engine. If for instance a car uses 4 litres of petrol at 32 megajoules per litre over a one hour period then obviously we would need 120 megajoules of power to power the motor over that period of time. And it doesn't matter what fuel you need, you still need to provide that amount of energy of the particular fuel that you use in this particular evaluation. If instead it is now powered by hydrogen, as I just said, you still need 128 megajoules of H2. As one litre of H2 releases 10.36 kilojoules for conversion to H2O, and that's at standard atmospheric temperature and pressure, which these days is 25 degrees centigrade and one bar, uh, which is a little over atmospheric pressure. Uh, when the engine uh, would need just 3.4 litres per second. So that's if you normally aspirate an engine, what you use for driving your engine normally around town, under that situation, instead of 17.4, you would only need 3.4 litres per second. So this demonstrates that in your vehicle, you only reuse about 20% capacity of your actual cylinder. And this assumes, of course, that the, both these calculations refer to the same vehicle. There are a couple of different ways that you can put hydrogen into a vehicle. First of all you can inject it. The only trouble with injectors are you put so little fuel into the engine. Much better from my perspective, although it's not the official view, that you bring it in in mix with your air through this particular valve system here. Um, when you bring it through uh, the injection is known as a stratified charge because it doesn't tend to reach the cylinders, wall cylinders, as it does when you bring it up uh, in a direct homogeneous combination of mix through the input uh, manifold. Okay, uh, I'll rip off that one and we'll move along a bit from there. <coughs> So, so far you've got an idea of how much hydrogen and how much petrol you need in an engine. 
Now we're up to a couple of home truths. There's a lot of people who support hydrogen who say one thing whilst the establishment says another. And what we will show here is both views. What we have on the right here is a diagram related to the amount of energy by mass, grams. And over here we have the energy density in kilojoules again, but this time it's related by volume. A given mass of hydrogen has 2.8 times the energy of the same weight as gasoline. Most people who support hydrogen will tell you that. And that shows it here on the graph. This uh, blue one here represents uh, hydrogen at atmospheric pressure. This one here represents hydrogen at 400 bar, which is about 6,000 uh, psi. Uh, as you can see, they're both the same height because, of course, they have the same energy density per gram. So this graph here is not much good to us when we see what we want in the engine. What you actually put in the engine is volume, not mass. So we need to go over here and have a look, see what the truth is. This little disc right down the bottom represents your hydrogen. That's the only bit of hydrogen that you can get into your engine under normal pressure, unless we do something special to it. And you can see here that this is petrol, this is diesel, and over here, just for point of interest, I show them what happens if you put water in your car and use that for the fuel base when you're using an onboard hydrolyzer. The ratio of this to this, if you look up here, is 3,000 to 1. So petrol has an energy density in respect of uh, volume 3,000 to 1 when you put it into your vehicle. That doesn't mean you can't use hydrogen to drive your vehicle. It just means uh, that you have a less density in your engine. You have to do something more than just put ordinary hydrogen into your vehicle to make it a better deal. There's a couple of other things I've added here for point of interest. Uranium, nuclear fuel. A gram of uranium gives you 470,000 kilojoules per gram. This over here is deuterium. This over here is helium. Deuterium is just heavy hydrogen. Normal hydrogen is called proteum. That's the first isotope. And that has one proton and one electron. Uh, deuterium is the second isotope of hydrogen. It has one proton, one neutron and one electron. There's also a third one, which is called tritium. Oh, by the way, some of you people might prefer to call that instead of deuterium. You could call it uh, deuterium, I think some of you use. No, I use the word deuterium. And the third isotope is tritium, and that has one proton, two neutrons, and one electron. Look at the energy levels of this. Here we have a harmful stuff, uranium. 470,000 kilojoules per gram. This is totally harmless. Deuterium just makes helium. It doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't even hurt the environment. 6 by 10 to the 11 doesn't mean something, much to some people. That is 6 billion kilojoules per gram of deuterium. That's an awful lot of energy that's coming out of that system. And we'll see how important that is later on in the evening. Okay, the uh, next thing we're going to look at is what happens in your vehicle if you put bottled hydrogen instead of putting an onboard hydrolyzer. I've included the, this one because I think it is part of the uh, important in respect to the lecture, even though it is basically about onboard hydrolyzers. Okay. Hydrogen is now cheaper to make than the cost of petrol, and that is genuine. Your dollar will go further if you put hydrogen in your engine than it will if you put petrol in your engine. And that is based on you making your own hydrogen at home. If you buy a pressurised system, they sell them in Canada, you can put it in the corner of your garage, you can make your own hydrogen, or you can put uh, uh, cells on the roof and you can take it directly from the sun. But if you pay for the electricity, you'll go further on your hydrogen than you will on petrol right now. And by the end of the year, you might be able to go twice as far. And the range is about the same as what you get with natural gas, but you need about twice the capacity of tanks uh, to put your hydrogen pressurised at about 10,000 psi. 
A little while ago, we couldn't go much higher than about 2,000 psi in tanks. Now you can go 10,000 without any trouble. You've got to find somewhere uh, that's able to pressurise it to that amount. But generally now, you can get most people will pressurise hydrogen up to about 6,000 psi. So you need about twice the capacity that you would normally use for LPG. Uh, there are basically three storage systems available to house hydrogen safely. Compression cylinders, cryogenic storage, and hydride absorption. They're the three systems. I only like one myself. Modern hydrogen storage tanks are made of lightweight carbon fibre and able to withstand pressures in excess of 20,000 psi. So even if you've got 10,000 psi in there, you're still only halfway up to its total capacity. These tanks can withstand a blast of dynamite, temperatures in excess of 1,500 degrees centigrade and an impact of a 357 magnum bullet. And carbon fibre tanks take only a few seconds to fill. They're now using those tanks for LPG, so they've given away the metal ones. They're using these because they're so superior. In the old days, uh, you couldn't pressurise a steel tank to much more than about 2,000 psi. If you try to put more pressure into it, you had to make the walls thicker. So you had a, a losing situation because the tank got heavier as, the as you got more energy in there and you needed more energy to drive the car because of the extra weight in the tanks. But now all that's solved. We don't need it at all. We only need these carbon fibre tanks. And that's made out of the carbon fibre that you would save if you made hydrogen uh, from hydrocarbon fuel and you uh, sequestered the carbon out of that to make these tanks. So it's quite a big industry waiting for somebody around the corner uh, to uh, sequester the carbon uh, out of hydrocarbon fuels and to use that to make all sorts of products. As you know, it's uh, uh, used for Kevlar, it's used uh, for the American aircraft. They're all now made out of carbon fibre. Uh, the tanks are made out of carbon fibre. It'll replace wood, it looks just as good uh, once it's been added, a bit of colour's been added to it. OK, we've gone through the carbon uh, tanks and the pressurised system. Cryogenic liquid hydrogen storage uses one third of its stored energy to liquefy the H2 and can require complex systems for both liquefying and refuelling the vehicle. But having said that, and it will power your car for one third of the range of petrol using the same storage displace displacement. In addition to that, cryogenic systems have a higher energy density uh, than normal pressurised hydrogen. The only trouble is you've got to waste half your fuel or one third of your fuel to be able to get it. It takes about a week uh, to normally pressurise it up uh, to the um, particular presser that is needed. That has to be done professionally. There are some fuel stations in Germany, one at the airport, Munich I think it is, that is using their own automatic system. It's so difficult to try and put this cryogenic hydrogen into your tank that it all has to be done automatically by an automatic machine. So I would cross that out simply because it's too difficult. If carbon fibre tanks can be filled in a few seconds, why should you worry about this? Figure one up here, this one up here, shows a modern lightweight activated carbon hydride type storage system. At atmospheric pressures, this is equivalent when fully charged to a pressure tank of 8,000 psi and the same displacement. In the experimental stage of some other types of carbon, um, refuelling of most hydrides take between 15 minutes and two hours. Uh, that knocks it back from standing there at the service station for putting hydride uh, hydrogen into your vehicle. So this system is bad because of this and because it has to be automatic. So the only system that's viable as far as I'm concerned is pressurised system using carbon fibre tanks. Over here, as you probably read already in figure three, uh, this is a spark injector plug that can be retro retrofitted to the conventional spark plug inlet. The system shown in figure two is this business stuck on the ends of all these bits of uh, stainless steel tubing and the one going to the spark plug is flexible stainless steel tubing. The rest is all fixed. It just contains a little bit of safety device here uh, to make sure the EPA doesn't knock you on the head plus your hydrocarbon tank and that's all there is to it.
about two hours job to fit that system to your vehicle. Uh, a bit quicker than putting on LPG. All of these devices were invented by McAllister and now it's a very efficient and reliable system. So I'd like so someone to give him about $5 million so we can go ahead and manufacture it and then we can start putting them into vehicles over here. Sending a few people over there to train. Uh, so instead of putting LPG on your car, put hydrogen on our vehicles and completely solve the problem of pollution with vehicles. Now we're going to go on to the hydrolyzer systems. Hydrolyzers are just electrolyzers, just a fancy name where you make hydrogen instead of electroplating the cathode in an electrolytic system. Over here is a demonstration uh, simply of a series connected, three cells in series. What happens is this one, its negative terminal is connected to this positive one of this. The negative terminal of this one is connected to the positive terminal of that. The other terminal comes out and is connected to the output. One side is the cathode, the other side is the anode. They are the elements to which it is connected to. The voltage for a series system is the voltage, sum total of the voltage for all the cells in series. If we were to use two volts here, two volts here, two volts here, the voltage for the whole system, when it is connected, would be six volts. However, the amperage for this system tends to flow from one cell to the next to the next. So the amperage for that whole system is the same as the amperage for one single cell. Let's say we're going to put 10 amps here. It's going to flow through there, flow through there. So for the supply, we're going to have six volts and that'll be at 10 amps potential with the voltage. Uh, multiplying those together, of course, that gives you 60 watts. With this system over here, this is a parallel connection. With this type of system, providing all the cells are identical, then the voltage will be the voltage for one particular cell. The negative side, as you can see down here, is connected to one electrode and the positive side is connected to each alternate electrode, then the amperage for each of those are independent. So the amperage for that system is the sum total of all the cells connected in parallel. So if we had 10 amps in this one, 10, 10, we'd have 30 amps against our supply, against 2 volts potential again, we've got 60 watts and both systems will produce exactly the same amount of gas. The people say, oh, this produces so much gas. No, it doesn't. They produce exactly the same if they're the same wattage. When we put them in a container, we'll call it a battery, we gain some sort of an advantage because if you see down here, this is connected to the negative terminal. That is called the cathode. The one that is connected to the positive terminal is called an anode. They are alternate, as you can see in the cell here. If we had up here, we would have two electrodes. In this one, we would have two. In this one, we would have two. And we've got exactly the same here, six electrodes. But in this situation, we have twice the quantity of batteries, simply because both sides of the plate actually function in the electrolyte. Electrolyte is a conductive medium uh, that allows ions to move through the system. With the series cell, only the ends are actually connected. The end electrodes are connected. Uh, there is a feudo connection between the cell, between there and there, that goes through here. However, electricity is lazy, and if you don't seal the edges of these plates, then electricity will jump from there to there, and you won't get any going through the rest of the cells. Unlike the parallel configuration, the series configuration acts in a bipolar arrangement. One side of this plate is a cathode. The other side of the plate is an anode. And that's the way it goes through all the system. So as the ions travel from there to there, forming a feudo-electrical connection. Uh, we've looked at how to connect the cells up, but we need to provide the power for it as well. As I said, there are many different variations of hydrolyzers, but all require an electrical power supply. If the water medium is conductive, it will require some kind of current control to prevent amperage runaway as the resistance of the medium changes due to heat 
or cell contamination. All electrolyzers, when you run uh, amperage through them, will get hot. This is an exothermic reaction as it converts to diatomic hydrogen and diatomic oxygen. Exothermic means that it gives out heat, and heat goes into that cell. So in order to uh, prevent a runaway condition where more and more amperage is, is used because of the increased heat in the cell, you need to be able to control it. That's the first criteria of making an electrolyzer. There are several ways to do this. You can use a Hall device, as I've shown you here. This is a rather complicated one. Uh, you can take that device out of that gap there in the ferrite core, and you can actually stick it to a piece of the wire. It still will function the same. However, you won't have the same amount of sensitivity. So this piece of wire here would normally carry the amperage that goes into the cell. By connecting this Hall device, uh, which gives you a voltage in response to electromagnetic reaction. So the more amperage goes through this wire, the greater the electromagnetic response onto the Hall sensor and the greater the power can be generated by the Hall sensor. By attaching to the end of that system uh, some sort of circuitry, you can control the amperage within this system. In addition to that, you can use capacitors. Capacitors have a set capacity for holding amperage. In the book that I provided with this lecture, that's available from the store, there's a lot more systems available than I've showed you here or have time to talk about. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, you can look into the book. There's a reference in the back of the book, uh, for a very worthy reference from someone who goes into all these systems uh, for controlling the amperage on hydrolyzer systems. In addition to that, there's George Wiseman who puts out the Hyzor system. I believe that's available at the back also. Uh, anybody who's thinking of doing this sort of systems should look at George Wiseman's Hyzor system. Very, very comprehensive and worthwhile reading and worthwhile purchasing. Down here, we have this little graph which re represents a conventional type hydrolyzer and how amperage and voltage goes through that particular cell. We could draw graphs for all sorts of situations for this particular arrangement. However, there are certain parameters, which we'll learn uh, in a few minutes, uh, that are necessary in most hydrolyzer systems. When all those parameters are met, this is the sort of graph that you will get as in respect of uh, the amperage on one, uh, the, the y-axis, and the voltage on the x-axis. At 1.23 volts, and everybody tells me that's the voltage which is ideal uh, for running your hydrolyzer. I'm very sorry to say you need to get it between 2 and 3 before you'll get a decent amperage across your cell. What's more than that, the amperage which we show here can also be related to the amount of catalyst that is in your electrolyte. Uh, what's a catalyst? A catalyst is a material that you add uh, to the water to make it conductive. And it also is not used up in the chemical process within the cell. It's still there when you used up all the water. The catalyst should still be there if you've done the right thing. All right, so there you are. Between 2 and 3 volts, no matter what cell it is, that's the voltage you apply to it, somewhere around about 2.5 volts. Uh, now what we've covered so far is how to connect it, how to power it, but we don't know how much gas we're going to make at this stage, so I think it's about time we looked into that situation. Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday gave us the laws of electrolysis, and he was the first to provide that quantitative analysis of the process of electrolysis. In all cases, the quantity of material evolved at each electrode when current is passed through the electrolyte follows the laws he discovered. So if you have a straight DC cell, that means you leave the voltage and the amperage constant at a DC potential throughout your process. You can't make any more gas than he tells you you can make for the amperage on the cell you have. The first law, the quantity of material transformed at each electrode is proportional to the quantity of electricity passed through the electrolyte. It doesn't say one word there about voltage. 
It only talks about Ambridge, or in this particular case, coulombs. Uh, what's a coulomb? A coulomb is one amp per second. So if you want to convert it. Uh, the weight of the elements, law two, the weight of the elements transformed is proportional to the equivalent weight of the elements. Uh, that law was brought in in respect of electroplating. It wasn't hit there really for hydrogen. So we converted a little bit to say the atomic weights of the elements divided by their valences says the same thing. So by the modern definition to liberate one mole of ions, what's an ion? An ion is an atom that either has extra electrons or minus electrons. So I'll read that again by modern definition. To liberate one mole of ions carrying a charge of either N plus or N minus, N moles of electricity in coulombs are required. We've got another term here, moles. Don't worry about it. It's just a quantity. And that quantity is determined by a gentleman called Avogadro, uh, Count Emilio Avogadro, who devised this in about 1806, I think, and it wasn't really used until about 1870, before they decided how important this was. So Faraday said, uh, we're going to use a mole. A mole has 6.02214 by 10 to the 23 electrons. That's what he's talking about, how many electrons there are in one mole. And if he wants to get the charge for that many electrons, he needs the charge on one electron. So the charge on one electron is shown here. 1.602177 by 10 to the minus 19. And because you have uh, 10 to the 23 up here and 10 to the 19 up here, you tend to cancel each other out. And we finish up with a Faraday constant that equals 96,485 coulombs per mole. That is one Faraday. Uh, something funny happened. I wish he'd uh, set his standard up slightly different because one Faraday does not separate uh, one mole of water. You need two Faradays to do that. And we'll have a look at that. Uh, if we look at this as a calculation, it might be easier to follow. So here we have the standard sort of cell that you used in chemistry when you went to primary school, I assume. OK, using the modern molar calculation. I put two types of calculations in the book, the one used by Faraday and this modern system, which is a little bit easier to follow. Since two moles of H positive, which is hydrogen positive ions, in Aquarius solution, that means that they only exist in a conductive liquid, which there is potential applied to that liquid, must be liberated to decompose one mole of water, liquid mole of water. A liquid mole of water is about 18 grams of water, or 18 cubic centimetres, seen as one cubic centimetre equals one gram of uh, pure water. Two moles of electricity are required. As I said, it would be nicer if you could have made that one mole to equal the next value. So two multiplied by one Faraday constant is 192,970 coulombs. And that liberates two grams of hydrogen. Two grams of hydrogen are diatomic hydrogen. And that has a volume at atmospheric pressure and 25 degrees Celsius of 24.8 litres. You will find different values in different books, but this is a modern value because we've now moved up to 25 degrees centigrade, whereas for a while we had zero degrees centigrade, uh, then we had 20 degrees centigrade, now we've got 25 degrees centigrade, and later on we're going to a different system because they want to round some figures off, but we're not up to that at this stage. So we have the volume, 24.8 litres. We have the mass, 2.105 or 106, depends on what, uh, how you want to round off the decimal. And that takes two coulombs of energy. Applying this, let's do a little exercise for that. Applying 10 amps for one hour, and remember we've got 10 amps multiplied by seconds. Remember one amp multiplied by one decadent equals one coulomb. So 10 multiplied by 60, multiplied by 60 minutes equals 36,000 coulombs uh, over that one hour period if you were applying 10 amps to that system. So the mass of hydrogen released in this particular case 
is 4.62 litres in one hour for 10 amps. Remember back a little bit earlier when I said you need 3.4 litres per second to run a two litre engine. This is a hell of a long way from that. And that's 10 amps, which is quite a bit of power. So uh, using the Faraday system is not necessarily real good because it's most, more than likely will not operate your vehicle. A lot of people think that oxygen is made on one electrode and hydrogen is made on the other. It is in a roundabout way, but not directly. As you can see here, OH negative. This is called a hydroxyl ion. It is a negative ion. It is formed at the positive electrode. And here you have your hydrogen ion, which is a positive ion, and that is formed at your negative electrode. Everything happens here. Nothing happens over here. What happens here is because this is positive, this rejects this H positive ion away from the water molecule, leaving behind this OH negative uh, hydroxyl ion sitting here. So the hydrogen whips down here, across here, and up here because this is a negative electrode. It gets attracted to it. So everything just happens here. We don't separate it up in the water, one going up and one going up the other one. All right, how do we get our oxygen, remember? It's half the volume of the hydrogen. What happens here is the OH negative ion joins up with another OH negative ion They've got one too many oxygen, so the oxygen says, up I go, and up it goes to the top. At the same time, it releases two electrons into the circuitry. Those two electrons travel all the way around the circuit till they get to the other side. They pick up two hydrogen positive ions, they give them their electrons, and up they go as diatomic hydrogen. OK, let's uh, move along a bit. What we said was you needed 3.4 litres per second of hydrogen to power a vehicle. Uh, but we only had, at 10 amps, we only had 4.6 approximately uh, litres per hour. But you can do something uh, as a supplementary system. Modern vehicles with injector systems generally require a very high quality of fuel to function efficiently. Low-grade home-brewed alcohols and terpenes tend to gum up the works very quickly. And commercial methanol, and maybe ethanol, I'm not sure, may also cause similar problems. You can probably remember a couple of years ago they grounded all the light aircraft because some idiot turned all the fuel into glue in all of their engines. The answer to this dilemma is to add H2, HOH gas, or steam to the mix in proportions of 5% to 7% by kilojoule values. Uh, this is if you're using a low-grade fuel. Uh, such combinations will considerably improve your fuel economy, keep your engine and injectors squeaky, squeaky clean, and lower your undesirable emissions. So you won't have so much pollution going up into the air. You won't have to worry about decoking your car ever if you use hydrogen, because it keeps it uh, constantly, acts as a solvent to clean out the carbon. And you'll get better production and better performance out of your vehicle. With pre-made H2, this is not a problem. So if you're putting a bottle of gas on your vehicle, you can certainly do it as a supplementary. But with an onboard hydrolyzer, it may be necessary to drop this percentage to about 1% to 2% for viability. Steam may be recirculated from the exhaust and fed into the air intake through a fine stainless steel screen and it may be also necessary to fit stainless steel plugs, especially if you put too much steam into the input manifold. Uh, what we're doing here is seeing whether or not we can put a hydrolyzer on our vehicle. Oh, and I might point out before then, back in 1940, Dr Heichel and Dr Thorne in New Zealand, Christchurch, I think it was, University. And uh, uh, they did a whole lot of research in this supplementation system. If you add 1.2 cc's per mile for each brake horsepower of your particular engine, and this is not in your notes if you're interested in writing this down, you will get double mileage. That will double your mileage. 1.2 cc's. Per mile, if you want to convert that, you can. 
uh, per brake horsepower of your vehicle. Now, if you want to bring this up to what you understand, that's about a 1.8 litre engine travelling at about 80 kilometres an hour. You'll need about a litre of hydrogen per hour. In addition to that, what Heichel and Thorne discovered was it has to be in a stachyometric mix with oxygen. So you also have to provide the oxygen. So you need half a litre of oxygen to go with it for that particular ratio. OK, let's have a look at our figures now. In the yellow up the top here are all the parameters at which we're going to use in this calculation. As we did before, we used four litres uh, over the one hour, and seeing as that's at 32 kilojoules per litre, we have 128 megajoules of power as we did before over that one hour. Uh, obviously, at a 5% supplementation, that 6.4 megajoules of energy will be needed from the hydrogen. 10 litres per minute, if you want to look at it as how many litres there are. But I prefer to convert it to kilowatt hours, and we find we've got 1.8 kilowatt hours for that 5%. And to cut a long story short, the hydrolysis, hydrolysis cell at 13.8 volts would need 130 amps for 615 litres per hour at 100% efficiency. Notice that, 615 litres. You can get away with one litre per hour if you're using it with petrol. The top efficiency of the alternator, you won't get any alternator that will give you much better than 70%. So you've got to put 2.6 kilowatt hours into your alternator in order to get 1.8 kilowatt out. And don't forget, no hydrolyzer generally operates at 100% efficiency, so I haven't taken that away in that particular regard. Uh, right, converting this to horsepower now, we've got 3.4 horsepower will be needed to drive your hydrolyzer. A normal alternator generally drags about 7 horsepower away from your engine, and you'll need to add the 3.4 to that, giving you 10.4 horsepower total drag on your engine, for your alternator and the hydrolyzer. Uh, this particular engine here, if you convert that through, you see that that produces about 46 horsepower. And if you take the 10.4 away from that, you've got 35.6 horsepower is left to pull your two-litre vehicle. You only need, on a flat surface, about five horsepower to turn your wheels. You've got 30 horsepower left there for hill climbing and acceleration, but in addition to that, you're going to save 50% of your fuel simply by using that hydrolyzer. So it is a viable system to use as a supplementary. And that's an ordinary uh, Faraday hydrolyzer where you put constant uh, amperage and constant voltage. Is there anything we can do better than Faraday tells us we can do? And the answer to that question is yes. I spoke about this HOH gas most of the night, and you're probably wondering why I've been harping on this so much. Uh, in a Faraday hydrolyzer, the first layer of positive hydrogen ions acts like an electroplating electrolyzer, coating the cathode with a layer of hydrogen ions that stick to the electrode in an electrostatic bond. After all, hydrogen is a metal, and we are carrying out an electroplating process. This is a cathode. There is our hydrogen, which is electroplating our cathode. Because of this, it blocks the thing to a certain degree. And the values that Faraday came up with is what happens after this has all been glued to the cathode and we get a little bit of hydrogen coming up to the surface, which has managed to pick up an electron or two through this barrier, which is called the Helmholtz layer. If we were able to apply vacuum from an engine to this particular cell directly, or we were able to move the electrolyte in a pumping system so we could pump the electrolyte around, or we could blow air through that particular cell, it is quite possible we could clean off some of this hydrogen. It'll be even easier to clean it off if we turn off the power momentarily. And then it will go to the surface naturally. We can even do better that. We can make this an anode 
momentarily. In that case, this positive hydrogen ion will quickly bounce away. And providing you get the air up there or you circulate it quickly enough, then you can get more energy going out of the cell because this never picked up an electron from the external circuit. Faraday's formula is based on the amount of electrons circulating through this system. So if you can scrape off this hydrogen and up the other end you've got the positive electrode with OH negative ions and you can scrape off some of that too, what do you have? You have hydrogen hydroxide, HOH hydroxy. It doesn't have the energy to turn into H2 and O2. It doesn't have the spark or the ignition to turn it back into water. So it's called, by my definition, an immature gas. It's just HOH gas. One big thing about HOH gas, it has 900 kilojoules more energy than H2 and O2 in the same combination. When you put it into the engine to combust it, it has 900 kilojoules more energy than you would to break down the H2 and the O2 before it conforms into steam and then into water into your exhaust pipe. So it's better to use HOH gas. You've got more energy there and a substantial amount of energy. If you remember the first chart, second chart that I put up tonight, it showed you how much energy you can get out of HOH gas. We've more or less covered everything that you need to know in respect to the theory. But if you're going to start doing this in a practical form, uh, then you need to know a little more about it. So we'll just sum up everything you need to know about making an electrolytic process uh, to separate hydrogen and oxygen. Catalyst concentrations in water to form an electrolyte are normally determined on a trial and error basis to ensure the amperage flow does not exceed the power supply limitations. So obviously you don't want to be drawing 100 amps if your power supply can only supply 10 amps. So you've got to regulate uh, your catalyst in your water so as it draws the, the correct amount of amperage. And we'll show you in a moment, moment how that can be done. An ammeter is used to determine when sufficient catalyst has been dissolved for appropriate resistance between the electrodes. Both potassium hydroxide, that's KOH chemical, and sodium hydroxide, that's NaOH chemical, are ideal alkalis to use as a conductive medium in water solution. They are inert to a large range of cell materials. In most cases, they will act as a perfect catalyst with stainless steel electrodes at 305 or 316 grade. And most PV PVC materials used for containers. Bakelite or battery cases are preferred container materials but are hard to come by. I haven't been able to find any Bakelite. Uh, I would like to because it's an ideal material to use for catalytic action. Aluminium is also suitable with KOH uh, but will deteriorate over time in direct proportion to the electrolyte concentration and increased temperature within the cell. Cast iron will last well if it is fully submerged in the electrolyte but will deteriorate quickly if only partly submerged obviously because it's subjected to oxygen and it will rust quickly if it's left only in the gas area. Acids have a very limited range of materials that can be used in the hydrolyzer. The electrodes are normally restricted to either lead or carbon. The casing can be a new battery case purchased from the local battery manufacturer. You can get some down Hoddle Street if you like. There's a battery manufacturer there. And that is specifically formulated for acid. Uh, contamination of the electrolyte is directly proportional to the amperage density and the voltage potential above 2 volts. You will contaminate your cell uh, if you put 12 volts on it on a regular basis other than just a short test. You will contaminate your cell if your energy density exceeds about 0.06 of an amp uh, per square centimetre. The higher the pressure within the cell, the higher the temperature within the cell, 
the more efficiently the cell will function within certain limits. Care must be taken in the selection of materials to ensure they can withstand the design parameters. The pressure of hydroxy should not exceed 100 psi or it may self-detonate. And I don't suggest you ever use pressurised systems for hydroxy. Because all it needs is a 6 microjoule of energy to set it off. It can happen with any electrostatic arc. Uh, some little bit of welding inside a container, even a pressure of 20 psi is enough to send it off. Uh, officially, it's 100 psi, and that's up to you if you pressurise it at all. If the per cell voltage is kept below 3 volts limit, the amperage density on the electrodes kept to within the range of 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 amps per square centimetre and the alkali content kept below 25% by mass, then the hydrolyzer should function as intended. If it is desired to separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, then a membrane known as a proton exchange membrane or a partition of dielectric material compatible with the electrolyte must be interposed between the anode and the cathode. With PEMs, only the thickness of the membrane needs to separate the electrodes. So you can put it as close as a piece of paper providing you use a proper dielectric material. With the dielectric divider, it must be extended below the bottom of the suspended electrodes so as to seal the cell into two separate compartments with only a small gap at the bottom to allow the ions to move underneath the divider from one electrode to the other, known as a salt bridge. For hydroxy, that's HOH gas, no divider is required. The electrodes should be as close as possible to maximise the gas production whilst reducing resistance. An accurate and uniform gap of 2 millimetres is ideal for current up to 40 amps. Uneven or closer gapping may result in arcing between the plates. Gapping over 6 millimetres will result in low gas production due to the high resistance across the electrolyte. Series cells must be completely sealed, as we spoke before, around the edges of the electrolyte below the water line to prevent the electrical bypass of the intermittent electrodes. However, a liquid vent hole has to be put up be uh, between the electrodes that's on the, uh, on the plating that insulates them, which if you don't do that, you can't circulate your electrolyte, you'll set up a vacuum between the plates and you'll still will stop functioning. All right, let's calculate this. Okay, if a 50 watt power system is used to drive a single cell and the potential difference is 2 volts, then the amperage available to drive the system is obviously 50 divided by 2 is 25 amps. That is 100%. Uh, most people would be an idiot to put 100% out of their supply system, uh, but I've uh, stupidly forgot to cut it down to its right, right value, so we'll have to use this calculation. Using Ohm's law, voltage over amperage equals resistance. So 2 over 25 equals 0 0.08 ohms resistance across the plates. Likewise, I would say to you, never get it down to that value. You'll have trouble with your cell. Try and keep it above that if you can. About 0 0.01 of an ohm, you can go down to that quite comfortably. Um, okay. So if 25 amps is supplied to the cell across a resistance of 0 0.08 amps for, say, one hour, and then we do our usual calculation here, 25 amps over one hour is 25 by 60 by 60 is 9,000 coulombs, 160 being seconds and the other 60 being minutes. The mass of gas generated is therefore 8.2 grams of gas over that one hour period. The volume of hydrogen is 11.54 litres of H2. And the energy, delta G, is a thermodynamic term referred to as a Gibbs function, and this represents the amount of energy that can be used for work. Uh, the Gibbs function says there's 237 kilojoules 
per mole of water of energy. So we have on this particular calculation 110.6 kilojoules of energy would be released by that 25 amps over the hour. And how big should our cell be? Go back to our formula here. At 0.01 amps per square centimetre, you would need 2,500 square centimetres. If only one side of the plate is to be used, you can use five parallel plate sets. Each one of those plates in that particular cell, there's two plates in a cell, would be 25 by 20 centimetres. Of course, if you put those all in one container and made a battery of it, uh, you would only need half that amount because both sides of the plates would be used. And that's how you would calculate up your system. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If you want a bit of a break, we'll come back and look, some, look at some practical systems.